start Zoom meetings and record them. Anybody ever been recording Zoom meetings? So if you ever have to do this for an organization that you're in, if you're running a club or something like that, and you need to record a meeting, you can do it directly, obviously, to your computer. Or if you contact WTS, you can set up record to the cloud, which is really nice because then it doesn't, I don't have to sit here and wait for it to uh, complete the recording on the computer itself. It's just doing it on Western Zoom Cloud. And then I can download it when I get back to my office. Much more efficient. So if you ever find that you're needing this function, highly recommend that you contact WTS about this. Anyway, nothing to do with today's class. Um, it's kind of a gloomy day outside. Does anybody have any exciting good news to share? Anything exciting happened over the weekend that you wanted to? Has anything interesting happened? Everybody's shaking their heads. Nothing interesting has happened. Surely something exciting has happened. Good news to share? No good news? I mean, I'm the same. I actually don't have anything exciting to share either. So I just thought maybe something, somebody had had some exciting news to share. No? All right, I'm going to ask again next week if there's anything exciting to share. Uh, think of something uh, if you've got something. So let's see what's in the chat. Does everybody say hi? Great. All right, so hi to everybody that's joining online. I'm going to go ahead and um, hide the floating meeting controls uh, and uh, reporting on. So a participant has enabled closed captioning. That's great. Uh, that means the captioning will appear. Let's go ahead and start our slideshow for today. Yeah. All right. It looks like we're all set and ready to go. So uh, I want to start this lecture with a little bit of review. Uh, first, a couple of announcements uh, about uh, course readings. As you know, there's a textbook associated with this class. Uh, you can get used copies uh, there. It's available as an electronic resource. Um, I think I mentioned last week that the uh, first edition of the textbook, which I think is from 2015, which is, I would say, 85 or 90 percent uh, good. No, I mean, actually, no, it's 100 percent good, but I mean, it overlaps with what we're talking about uh, in the class, about 85 percent. So that first edition is available in the library uh, as, a, as an electronic book. So you can get uh, almost everything uh, for free from the library. Um, if you want to, so if you haven't purchased the text or if you don't want to uh, buy the textbook, uh, you can certainly share with other people. Um, you can use the uh, ebook for free uh, and then maybe find someone who does have a copy of the second edition and uh, that will help you sort of uh, see the things that you're missing uh, that way. Also, the second edition of the textbook is available uh, at the library for a course reserve. So there's a copy of it available there. So um, it's great if you want to have your own copy of the textbook, uh, a physical copy or a digital copy. Uh, but if you don't want to uh, buy the book, there's lots of ways to get the content uh, in the text uh, without having to lay out uh, cash for it. It's, I assume it's probably also available uh, in some sort of unauthorized uh, version online. Uh, so I'm not going to mention anything else about that. Uh, given that I wrote the book, I wouldn't want to... <laughs> Uh, point you towards uh, ways to get it for free, but you can find anything for free, obviously, if you try hard enough. So uh, there should be lots of ways to get it, but certainly there are at least two different versions uh, available at the library that don't require any purchase. Uh, the ebook version uh, and the print version of the second edition, which is on course reserve uh, as well. Any other questions about accessing course content? Uh, the slides should be available. Uh, so let's go ahead and go. So we're going to do two lectures. Uh, today, the first one will take about an hour, hour and 10 minutes. Uh, the second one which should be about the, shame, the same. Uh, if I don't get sidetracked, uh, we should be able to finish up probably around uh, 12 o'clock, which is my goal for today. Um, so we have a three hour time period. Actually, it's two hours and 50 minutes, uh, but we don't have to fill it all if we make uh, our way through all of the material. Uh, if, by the way, we ever don't finish uh, some of the material in that two hours and 50 minute window, uh, usually what I'll do uh, is push some of that to the next week. Uh, so we'll always cover everything. Uh, if we fall a little bit short, that's okay. If we go a little bit over, I'll just put that material uh, on the next week. Uh, so let's review just briefly some of the stuff from last week. Uh, some of the stuff I'll review uh, will be questions that will show up on the quiz number one, which is next week. Is that right? 
So quiz number one is next week. Uh, it appears online after uh, the lecture and it'll cover material from class one, two, and three. Uh, so for some review material, keep this stuff in mind. So I'll probably ask a few questions about some of the characteristics of uh, this system one and system two. Uh, this is a general sort of meta theory in cognition uh, and the psychology of thinking that kind of describes the different fast and slow processes that we go through. Uh, it's not one unified theory. There are lots of different versions of this theory. Uh, but one of the things that they sort of coalesce around are the idea that uh, we've got a fast way of thinking. Uh, maybe it lines up with a uh, uh, these evolutionary, more primitive brain structures. It relies on associative learning and there's stimulus response learning. Some of the faster um, uh, reflexes that we have uh, might be characterized uh, by, by the system. And of course, fast access to really immediate memories. So some of the cognitive biases that we're gonna talk about uh, in subsequent classes, uh, like a recency bias or, or an availability heuristic are relying on this system one. So making a decision based on the first thing that comes to mind is an example of a system one heuristic. So we talked about this last week. So keep in mind that it's the faster system. It's the one that we think that's more intuitive. Uh, it relies on these evolutionarily more primitive brain structures, things that are present uh, in non-human species. On the other hand, uh, this system two, uh, and by the way, the way I remember the difference between system one and system two is one is faster than two. Uh, so two is this slower system. It's also the more recently evolved, hence the name system two. Uh, it's the second one. Uh, it's present in humans, uh, possibly some substrates of this system are present in non-human primates, uh, and it involves language and reasoning, which means that it depends on access to prefrontal cortex. So a well-developed prefrontal cortex in humans uh, allows us to engage in a slower, more reasoned-based uh, thinking process, which lets us check some of the first things that come to mind, check some of our instincts, uh, and so on. Does this seem pretty clear so far? Keep this in mind, it's gonna come up uh, in lots of other classes, even in today's class, uh, when we talk about how similarity is used in solving problems. Um, we also talked about some challenges to the thinking process. There's lots of challenges, but I kind of highlighted two challenges. What was the first of those two challenges? Can anybody remember back from last week? So multitasking. So multitasking was the first of the two challenges. Why is multitasking a challenge to your thinking process? So what are things about multitasking? Yes. Split your attentional resources between multiple things. Split your attention between multiple things. And if you split your attention between multiple things, what's one of the uh, side effects or uh, some of the fallout of splitting your attention between multiple inputs? That would time it takes to switch between two things means you can't even miss things. Time it takes to switch between two things means you can miss things. Exactly. It's well put. Maybe unable to ignore distractions. You could be unable to ignore distractions because you've got this habit of paying attention to more than one thing. I mean, all of us multitask. It's not like there are people who don't multitask. Some of us do a little bit more than others. Some of us may be a little bit more uh, practiced, have a stronger or less. Uh, well, strongly developed habit, but those are one of the challenges. So you're missing some information, uh, which leads me to the next challenge. What was the second challenge uh, that we highlighted? Evidence. Incomplete evidence. Uh, so why is incomplete evidence also a challenge to a good thinking uh, and I think the thinking process? What would be a challenge? And I guess we didn't actually say in class why exactly it was a challenge. We talked about one ways to overcome one of the ways to overcome that cognitive offloading. So why would you think that incomplete evidence would be a challenge to good thinking? You don't have all the information, so it's more likely that you'll make the wrong decision. You, do, you don't have all the information. That means it's more likely that you won't make the optimal decision. Uh, it means it's more likely that you may resolve things based on uh, a fast system one response. The first thing that comes to mind is what you have, but maybe that's not all of the information. 
Now, as we'll see in a lot of other classes, uh, this will come up in today's class. It's going to come up in next week's class. It's probably going to come up in just about every class. Uh, that when we're talking about thinking, decision making, reasoning, problem solving, and the sort of complex cognition that we de defined thinking as, uh, lots of times we make fast decisions on incomplete evidence. And we've got a lot of systems and a lot of strategies to help us do that to the best of our abilities. We call these heuristics, uh, and we call them occasionally cognitive bias. Uh, heuristics and cognitive bias, uh, two different terms, uh, mostly the same thing. We refer to a bias as something that's pushing us in the wrong direction. That's a result of a heuristic. But the heuristics are usually good for us. They let us deal with this problem of incomplete evidence. Since we rarely have everything we need to make the best possible decision uh, or to make uh, the optimal decision or to solve the problem in the best possible way, sometimes we do, but we don't always. We've developed strategies to help us deal with that incomplete evidence. So ways to uh, use what we do have to make the best possible decision given uh, the circumstances. And that's what a heuristic is. We'll talk about that today and we'll talk about that in many different classes. Um, heuristics aren't good or bad. That's just one of the ways in which we tend to think about things. Uh, we deal with the incomplete evidence uh, by having cognitive shortcuts. So that's why they're challenges. Oh, here's one that almost always, yeah, this is something I've never figured out. When I reformat stuff, occasionally these text boxes uh, in PowerPoint have this, has anybody ever come up across this where it doesn't actually think that that's a word? It just kind of splits the word right in the middle. Um, it, it's a sub sub uh, menu that you have to find. Occasionally these text boxes are put in there like that. And I thought I fixed this one, I didn't. That is not a one. That says, what were the experimental conditions used in the app top versus notebook study we discussed? So what were the experimental conditions? Let's talk a little bit about that experiment. The laptop versus notebook. We've talked about several different laptop studies. But the laptop versus notebook condition. Uh, what were the experimental conditions? So if you were setting up an experiment like this, what would be the conditions that you would put your participants into? They remember. So taking notes, a notebook, taking notes on a laptop. There were two, or, yes. Um, in, like, is it the one we did last week? There was the one where they did, they told the students to try and not to just word for word what the professor was saying. And then there was the students who were using the laptop and they weren't able to do anything. Right, exactly. So in uh, several different versions, uh, there was one study, there was one condition. So if you didn't hear, uh, there was one condition, of course, where subjects were told, uh, take notes on a laptop. Uh, there was another condition where subjects were told, uh, take notes in your notebook. Uh, and then in a second study, there was a third condition where participants were told, uh, take notes on a laptop, but try not to paraphrase, try not to take verbatim notes. Uh, try to abstract a little bit. So they were given this intervention. Uh, so I often ask these que questions about these, uh, these experiments uh, on the quiz uh, and on the exam. And some of the ways in which uh, I try to assess your uh, knowledge or memory of these uh, different uh, experiments is to ask you about how the experiment was done. So what were the conditions? That was one of the, uh, that's a, one question that was asked about this. Um, what were the outcome measures? So I don't have this written up in here, but on that study, uh, what were what were they measuring? Uh, so what was the deep what were the dependent variables in that study? Word count and then matched by verbatim. So they measured word count. Uh, so word count was of those three different conditions. Uh, how much? How many different word? How many words did you write? Uh, so that's a clear uh, quantitative uh, measure. What was the other? They wrote. So what was the percentage of verbatim overlap? Uh, so those were two things in which uh, we found that the laptop users excelled, right? They wrote more, they had more verbatim overlap. Uh, that was true both in the original study and was that one true in the replication study as well? Did they replicate the word count and verbatim overlap? Does anybody remember? You're shaking your head yes? The answer is yes. 
Uh, they replicated the word count effect. Laptop users type more words. They replicated the verbatim overlap. What was the other set of uh, dependent variables, the one that was the critical dependent variable in the original study? It was um, like recall, so they really don't have a abstract question. So it was recall. How well did you remember the information uh, in the TED Talk? Uh, and as you pointed out, there were two kinds of questions, uh, factual questions, which are just remembering facts that were presented, and conceptual questions, which were asking the participants to extrapolate a little bit uh, and show depth of processing. In the original study, which group did best on the factual questions? Is there any difference between the groups on factual questions? They were about the same. They did about the same. Both groups did well. Uh, in the original study, uh, what was the difference on the conceptual questions? Which group did the best on the conceptual questions? The ones that hand wrote their notes. People that hand wrote their notes seem to do best on conceptual questions in the original uh, study. In the replication study, uh, which group did best? Uh, which groups, or how did the groups perform on the factual items on the replication study? Were there differences between any of the groups? Is one group better than the other? So if you'll be shaking your head, no difference. Uh, and by process of elimination in the replication study on the conceptual items, was there any difference between the two groups? There was no difference between the two groups. Um, so one of the things I often ask, uh, and this is a standard question that I ask on the quiz itself and occasionally on the exam, uh, is a lot about these different aspects of a study like that. The dependent variables, which are the outcomes, independent variables, which are the experimental condition. Uh, and you do wanna make sure that you read that question, those kinds of questions carefully if they're is a replication study or several studies that we talk about, uh, whether that's a direct replication like that one or that smartphone study that we also talked about a failure to replicate. Uh, make, sure you, make sure you check to see whether the question is about the original study or the replication study. If it doesn't say, uh, then probably the answer does not depend on one of those two uh, uh, distinctions. Uh, Similarly, if we talk about several different experiments that use the same kinds of methodology, uh, make sure you make a note of whether or not it specifies a particular experiment or the whole cluster of experiments uh, generalizing some results. So this is all just review, but also giving you maybe a little bit of insight uh, into how to think about the quiz that's gonna happen uh, next week. This is the most sensitive remote. I have to be standing right here. Let's talk about some introductory questions about similarity and why similarity matters. I mentioned last week uh, that this may end up being sort of the least thinking related uh, topic, but I'll try to tie from pretty much every uh, topic we, uh, every subtopic in this lecture, I'll talk about how it relates to thinking. Uh, so how it relates to memory, how it relates to solving problems uh, and making decisions. But similarity uh, is, we can think about it in a lot of different ways. So if, before you've read any of the, done any of the readings or thought about the psychology of similarity, the cognitive psychology of similarity, uh, we probably all have a pretty good uh, understanding of what similarity means. So what does it mean to you uh, to say that two things or two ideas uh, are similar to each other? That sentence makes no sense. What does it mean for two things or two ideas to be? No, it does make sense. Okay, I just read it wrong. What does it mean for two things to be similar? They might share features. They might share features. So they might have the same perceptual uh, characteristics. Two red things would be similar because they are two red things. What are some other ways or other ways that you might sort of have a definition, a personal definition of what it means for two things to be similar to each other? What are other ways for things to be similar? a similar function, like they do the same thing? They do the same thing. And that could be because they have some of the same perceptual features, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean they have the same perceptual features. So you can accomplish the same function uh, in different ways. And so two things or two ideas might be similar to each other because they have, uh, this, they do the same thing, even if they do it in a different way. Are there other ways in which you can imagine things being similar? You define things as being similar. Are they within the same category? Within the same category. So you label them the same way. 
Uh, and that might uh, be uh, captured in this second question. So are two dogs, or two anything, but let's just take two dogs. Two dogs similar because they share important features, which they do, right? Because dogs have dog features. They have, uh, you know, the dog tongues and tails and they make dog sounds. So there are lots of perceptual features uh, that all dogs seem to have in common. Maybe there isn't one feature that every single dog shares, but there's lots of shared featural overlap. So that when you see a group of dogs and a group of non-dogs, you can usually tell the difference, right? Pretty quickly. So are they similar because they share the features or are they similar because they are labeled or categorized as dogs? In other words, is there some additional similarity that comes from just being a member of the same category or being labeled the same thing? Uh, possibly. Uh, so possibly there's a, an additional boost of similarity that we give to things because we give them the same label, uh, because we uh, treat them as the same Thing. We treat them as part of the same behavioral equivalence class. So featural overlap, functional overlap, and categorical overlap are three different ways uh, that we tend to think of things as being similar. We'll talk about the first two of those uh, in today's lecture. We'll talk a little bit about categorical similarity uh, today, but we'll also talk more about that in two weeks when we talk about categories and concepts uh, in more detail. But just being in the same category tends to increase the amount of perceived uh, similarity between two or a number of things. So why would we want to study similarity? I said that this is a topic that uh, seems a little bit distant uh, from the psychology of thinking. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons that I include this uh, in the lecture and in the class and in the textbook uh, is that I think it's important because it underlies a lot of important cognitive processes. Uh, so sim as we'll see in the next few slides, similarity is an important part of memory retrieval. It's an important part of problem solving. It's an important part of object recognition. Uh, the basic premise or the basic computation of the similarity between uh, things, especially things that you perceive that are from the out coming from the outside perceptual world, uh, comparing the similarity between a percept and a concept, uh, something that's represented in the brain and mind, is an important part of how we recognize things and how we uh, remember things and how we determine things and make judgments about things. So that's one, and I'll have a few slides about that. It's also an important domain general construct in cognition. And by domain general, which I'll again go into a little bit more detail, domain general means uh, that it seems to work the same for lots of different objects. So there, are, there seem to be some general principles of similarity uh, that are universal uh, to our cognitive experience. Calculating the similarity between uh, two objects uh, doesn't, doesn't always depend, and parts of that don't depend on what the object is. So though a lot of the computation of similarity seems to not depend on the specifics that you're comparing, but it's a general computational process. Uh, so there's a general computational process involving uh, psychological space uh, that seems, seems to transcend individual objects. So it's a domain general construct. It can be an important diagnostic tool. Being able to tell the difference between two things depends on your level of familiarity with those things. And it can let uh, it can sort of be an indicator of how familiar you are with uh, a domain or how familiar you are with a series of objects, how much of an expert you are. As we'll see many lectures from now, uh, towards the end of the class, when we talk about expert level cognition, uh, experts seem to regard similarity in slightly different ways from novices. Same domain general construct, same general computation uh, and computational aspects, aspects of the similarity, uh, but experts with expert level knowledge uh, might be able to perceive features in different ways, and they might be able to combine features in different ways and see different relations uh, that novices can't. So this can be a way to diagnose the difference or tell the difference between an expert and a novice uh, and their level of experience with objects. And finally, similarity is one of these uh, aspects of cognition, which seems to bear direct relationship with the outside physical world. A lot of the thinking process that we're gonna talk about 
uh, when we talk about uh, using language to solve problems, or when we talk about concepts and categories, and when we talk about inductive and deductive reasoning, often doesn't seem to share a relationship with the physical outside world. Similarity does, though. Uh, lots of aspects of similarity depend on uh, the relationship between features in the physical world. In other words, before you perceived something as being similar, they may be close to each other in physical space, the same way that they are in psychological space. I'm gonna go through a slightly more in-depth example for each one of these, uh, and then we'll get on to talking about how people measure uh, similarity. Uh, so similarity and cognition, I said similarity is an important part of cognitive processes. Let's talk briefly about object recognition, memory problem solving, uh, and reason. Uh, the first of these, object recognition, is not a topic we'll spend a lot of time talking about in this course, uh, though it will be important in uh, memory. But these others, memory, problem solving, and reasoning, are topics that we'll have an entire uh, class on. Uh, and you'll see how similarity is involved uh, in these topics. Uh, so it's pretty easy to recognize this without almost with no thought at all, right? You can recognize the pumpkin as soon as it appears on the screen. Uh, I would be willing to bet that all of you, without even saying the word pumpkin, uh, knew exactly what this was, right? This is not a trivial uh, problem. Uh, now, how do you think you recognize something like this? Well, one possibility in the way most object recognition models deal with this is that the incoming information activates areas of the retina, activates primary and secondary visual cortex, which connects to stored representations of things. In other words, all of the times that you've seen pumpkins in the past have structured uh, your uh, neural system in a particular way, connection, a status, or a, a state of activation uh, among different neurons, which is your mental representation. That happens every time you see a pumpkin. And when it happens again, uh, your brain recognizes the similarity between previous states of activation and the current state of activation. And the conclusion that you make is, yep, it's a pumpkin again. Uh, I recognize it because it's very similar to the state of activation in my brain the last time I saw a pumpkin. Uh, and in fact, each time you look at it, you're reinforcing that uh, relationship, right? So the recognition happens because what you see activates your brain in a way that is similar to the way your brain was activated the last time you saw a pumpkin. Uh, any of these objects, familiar or not familiar, can be recognized in more or less the same way, right? Uh, you can recognize this quickly, water bottles. You can recognize ancient uh, digital technology. Like, did anybody ever remember having one of this, a phone like this, one of these heavy sort of phones that only dials <laughs> numbers? Well, it doesn't even dial, it's just push button. Uh, so you kind of recognize these things. Uh, you probably have seen these ancient uh, music storage devices, these uh, uh, CD cases. So whether it's familiar or not, whether it's current or not, uh, whether it's in the right orientation or not, it activates something, right? Maybe it's been years since the last time that you've seen a CD case, uh, but you still have some residual activation. Uh, right? You still know what that is because you've seen them before. Uh, and so when you see it again, it doesn't take long. It wouldn't take more than a few seconds to recognize each one of these. Now, it's possible it takes some of you, uh, some of us or any of us, just a minute or two to come up with the name for one of these things if it's not highly familiar. But most of us can recognize it as something that we know, right? Uh, even if it takes a minute to come up with a name for this, a CD case or a jewel case, or whatever they used to call it, right? Uh, doesn't mean you don't recognize it. There's still a quick similarity overlap. Um, similarity also works along the same ways with memory retrieval. So that object recognition process that we talked about is also uh, a type of memory retrieval because we see something and we uh, connect it to a previous re uh, representation and we often retrieve from our memory what the name is of that object. Um, in memory retrieval, there are other kinds of memories. Uh, there are spreading activation. How many of you are familiar with the term spreading activation theory? Uh, if you're not, uh, we're gonna talk more about it next week. But spreading activation theory is one of many theories uh, in memory representation. Uh, and the idea is that you have a semantic memory network. Uh, things that are similar to each other 
are remembered at the same time that, uh, so if you remember one thing, you remember things that are similar to that thing, right? We've been talking about digital technology, old fashioned cell phones, uh, old fashioned music uh, devices. When you see the CD case, you might also uh, activate representations for uh, you know, vinyl records uh, or cassettes uh, or other uh, archaic uh, and out of date uh, music storage media, right? Uh, so that's the idea of spreading activation. You remember one thing, and the next thing that you remember is the thing that is similar to that thing. Uh, and the activation spreads. And so the less similar some concepts get, the longer it takes you to remember those things. We'll talk about some of that research uh, next week. So spreading activation depends on similarity. A target activates a concept. So you see something, it activates a concept, uh, and this activation spreads to related concepts so that you can remember or recognize or think about things that are similar more quickly then you can recognize, remember, or think about things that are less similar because it takes you longer to, for that activation to spread to those more distantly related ideas. And things that are unrelated uh, takes even longer because you're thinking about this related area of the semantic network. Um, other kinds of memory retrieval. Is this the same pumpkin or a different pumpkin? Same or different? How many say same? Anybody say different? Anybody not sure? I made the slide, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's different. It is different, it's a different one. So it's the same, same kind of thing, uh, different example. Uh, it's the same type, but it's a different token of that type. Uh, so we would need similarity to be able to tell the difference, right? If I were asking you explicitly to say, I'm gonna show you some images, and for these images, I want you to say, is it the same or different? You would have to think about that first image. Uh, you would then think about the second image and you would calculate the similarity between those two. And if the similarity is, uh, or the distance between those two is zero, in other words, if they overlap completely, they're not different from each other, then the answer is they're the same. Uh, if there's any place in which they diverge, uh, then they're different, right? So that's a similarity calculation on very short uh, memory retrieval uh, intervals. Memory is also, or similarity is also really important in more complex planned thinking operations like problem solving. Uh, so memory retrieval, object recognition, these are pretty uh, cognitive psychological constructs most of us are familiar with, but problem solving is one that is clearly an active thinking process, right? You've got to work to solve a problem. Uh, you've got to uh, think through a problem. Uh, and we space all sorts of different kinds of problems on a regular basis. Some of them are complex, some of them are simple. But in most cases, when we're working through a problem that involves a series of steps or series of operations, uh, one of the things we want to do is think about how we're getting closer to the solution. So in this theory, which we refer to as a problem space theory, don't need to worry about it now because we have a whole lecture on problem space approach. But a problem space uh, is the uh, representation of all of the possible ways to solve a problem. So it's this conceptual space or this psychological space that contains all of the possible ways to solve a problem. That means that there are faster and shorter ways through that space. In the same way that your representation of Western's campus uh, contains faster and slower ways to get to places, uh, but there are lots of different ways to get from this building to uh, the Natural Science Center, right? There are lots of different ways you can go, and there's a fastest way, and there are less fast ways. Uh, and uh, those, you can use that analogy with problem space. There are faster ways to solve the problem, and there are less fast ways, but they're all contained within the problem space. Like a shortcut. Exactly, a shortcut to get to a different solution is a heuristic. Uh, heuristics depend on knowledge and heuristics also depend on calculating similarities. We get similarity in two ways. One, the similarity between where you start to solve a problem and how close you are to the solution, right? You can actually, in many problems, you can see, well, I'm getting closer. Uh, if you're solving a, a word problem like Wordle, how many of you do Wordle still on a regular basis? 
I'm halfway there. I have three guesses and I haven't finished yet. Sometimes I just give up for a little while, come back to it, uh, and I can solve my wormhole. Uh, yesterday's, I think I got in five because it was a very uncommon word. Uh, it's not a word that I use very often. Um, anyway, with Wordle, it's really easy to see how close you're getting, right? Because it tells you when the words are correct. Solving a crossword puzzle, literally see how close you are because you're filling in uh, squares, right? So sometimes you can actually measure objectively how close you are to the solution. But in other problems, you can't always measure it objectively like that, but you can still calculate how close am I to solving this problem? Uh, how close am I to being able to accomplish the thing that I wanted to accomplish? Um, so that's one way in which similarity uh, is involved in problem solving. Another way in which similarity is involved in problem solving is we tend to group similar problems together. You notice I talked about Wordle, and then I talked about crossword puzzles. Those are similar kinds of problems. The next thing that comes to mind uh, is another kind of word problem, right? So when you think about games, you think about other games, you think about problems like uh, word problems, you think about other kinds of word problems. So we tend to group similar problems together. The third way in which similarity is involved in problem solving has to do uh, with this idea of solving it by a heuristic. Once you recognize the problem via similarity, uh, and you activate similar problems, you can solve it more quickly than by going through all of the steps. In other words, you use your knowledge or your familiarity with a specific domain to solve a problem more quickly. Just like you use, you know, when you're you first year at Western, you don't know uh, where everything is. Maybe it takes you a little bit longer to find one building or the other. The more familiar you get, uh, the easier it is to get from one building uh, to the next. The easier it is to find where your classes are going to be, to the extent where I, I imagine this is true of at least some of you. This is certainly true of me having been at Western for uh, 20 years. Lots of times if somebody asks where a building is, I don't know how to answer that question, <laughs> even though I know where all the buildings are. I don't always know because I think about like, how quickly can I get to this building I need to get to? Or who is in that building that I'm going to visit I don't remember the name of the building. I just know that if I need to get to Professor X's office, I walk this way, right? So sometimes it takes me a few minutes to go back and remember which building I'm in, which building this is in. Uh, that's a different level of knowledge, right? Once you get more familiar with things, you don't always need to remember uh, uh, the labels. You just say, oh, I go this way, right? That's the way that I go. You, you know how to get there. You probably do this in your own neighborhood. There are probably streets one over from you uh, where you go walk through or drive through on a regular basis, you're not 100% sure what the name of that street is uh, or what some of the cross streets are, even though you've lived there for 10 or 20 years. Uh, it's common to not remember those kinds of things, even though you're familiar with them. They're very uh, familiar. You use your access to that knowledge to do things quickly. So how does this work? How would similarity work in problem solving? So here's how it might work. And we'll come back to this graph when we talk about problem solving in more detail. Suppose you've got some kind of complex problem. It's a math problem or an investment problem uh, or a medical diagnosis or some kind of complex problem that you do not know the answer to right away. Right? You're learning how to do this. So maybe you're learning uh, calculus uh, or you're learning uh, some kind of investment strategy or you're learning uh, as a medical student uh, to make certain kinds of diagnosis based on evidence. Right? So what you do is you use a series or series of steps or uh, an algorithm. In other words, you use a series of steps that is guaranteed or likely to get you the right solution. Does the patient have this feature? Uh, does the patient present in this way? Uh, does the patient have this history? And you combine this information uh, to try to arrive at a diagnosis. And you combine this information to try to rule out other diagnoses, a differential diagnosis. Right? So you can use that information and you go through it step by step. We do this when you're learning how to uh, maybe cook something or prepare a meal. Or you might do this when you're learning how to uh, set up a, uh, a new computer. Right? You go through a series of steps. You're setting up an iPad for the first time. It is a series of steps you've got to go through. Right? And the iPad guides you through each one of those steps. Uh, and you know from past experience, setting up a phone or a computer or an iPad, which steps you care about. All right, so you're going through this series of steps. And when you're done, you've got a new iPad or you have a properly diagnosed 
uh, patient, uh, or you've got the right answer on your calculus problem. It takes a while though, right? I mean, you've got to go through a series of steps, which means you've got to follow each step in order. Uh, sometimes you have the steps written down if you're following a recipe. Um, but the more you do it, and this, I think I used an example like this last week when I talked about what should I wear when I go out for a run and what kind of weather, right? Uh, and the more you do it, the more familiar you are, with it, the less likely it is that you need to uh, resolve resolve the problem or solve the problem by going through a series of steps. So you're solving with the algorithm, but each time you do it, you say, yeah, you know, it worked that time. Uh, it worked this time, it worked this time, it worked this time. And you keep, you keep noticing uh, and you keep storing the information. Uh, you're storing features, you're storing examples, uh, you're remembering examples, uh, and you get more and more familiar with it. These memory traces start to get stronger the more times you solve that kind of problem. If you're a physician, the more times that you make this diagnosis, uh, the more familiar you get with that kind of patient. What eventually starts to happen for most experts and most people familiar with the domain is that they don't do this as much. They don't rely on the steps as much. Uh, they don't rely on street names when giving directions. And that's why I sometimes forget. Uh, they don't rely on going through the individual steps. Uh, if you uh, like to cook a lot, for example, uh, and you have a certain thing that you make often, uh, maybe you learned once by following a recipe, but then you get more familiar with it. Uh, you probably make a couple of small changes that uh, work well for you. And if somebody asked for the recipe, uh, you'd have to take a little bit of time to go back and unpack all of those things because you're just so used to doing it uh, from memory, right? This is what experts do. These get stronger, this connection doesn't need to be relied on, and you solve the problem more quickly from memory. Experts use their memory to help them solve problems, uh, to jump over or to vault over this slower algorithmic process. Uh, and this is an example of a heuristic, using what you know to solve the problem more quickly. Uh, this happens using system one. Things come to mind because you recognize the similarity of the situation that you're in now with the similarity uh, with some of the previously solved problems. I'm in a comfortable area. I'm in a comfortable domain. I know how to do this. I've done this every day for the last 10 years. This is something I'm really comfortable with. I'll just do it really quickly uh, because I've done it all of these times. Occasionally, as we'll see in the problem solving lecture, this can set you down the wrong path because if there's one small difference here and you've overlooked it and you've calculated the similarity and it is still a high similarity, but there's a critical difference that means that you're not gonna solve it the right way. Occasionally that heuristic does lead you down the wrong path uh, and you solve the problem wrong or you make the wrong judgment or you make the wrong decision. But usually these heuristics uh, work well for us and that's why we continue to use them. It's faster though. Similarity lets you solve the problem more quickly. Um, we use similarity in induction. Uh, we take what we know about something and we try to predict the future, predict features based on its similarity to something we've seen before. Um, in the text, I talk a little bit about this both in the induction chapter uh, and also in the similarity chapter. Uh, this is what's known as a Hubbard squash. Has anybody ever seen a Hubbard squash? I mean, why would you? It's kind of an ugly looking squash. It's a huge squash, actually. It's about the size of a basketball. Uh, it's kind of a bluish gray, um, but it is a winter squash. And since you know it's a winter squash and it does have some familiar features to you, it's got a little thing on the end that kind of looks pumpkin-ish, right? It's kind of pumpkin shaped. And even though it's not the color of a pumpkin, uh, it does kind of have that winter squash vibe, right? acorn squashes, butternut squashes, pumpkins, they've all kind of got a similar characteristics to them. When you cut open a pumpkin or a butternut squash or an acorn squash or any one of the other more familiar kinds of winter squashes, what's on the inside? Squash is on, you know, it's kind of orangish yellow, right? Every other squash I've ever cut open in the past has had kind of an orangish yellow interior. Pumpkins are orangish yellow, butternut squashes, acorn squashes. 
different shades of orange and yellow, right? But that's always what's on the inside. And there's always seeds on the inside and stringy fibers, right? So you kind of know um, if you've ever cut open any kind of squash at any kind, at any time, you kind of know what's going to be on the inside. Um, that's exactly what's on the inside of a Hubbard squash too, right? You can use your basic familiarity to say, okay, well, it's similar enough to other things that I've seen that even though this is the first time I've ever seen a Hubbard squash, I can predict what's going to be in there. I'm not going to be surprised, right? And when this is not my child, by the way, this is just some random kid that came up when I uh, did a Google image search uh, on Hubbard squash. So I don't know who this is, uh, but she's really pleased to see what's on the inside of that Hubbard squash. But it's not surprising to me. Um, first time I cut open a Hubbard squash, I bought. I was at the I was at the Western Fair Market or something, and I, I don't know what I was there for, but uh, and I was like, "What are those that nobody is buying?" And he's like, "It's a Hubbard squash." And I said, "Okay, I'll try." He says, "What do you do with it? What do you make pies? You know, whatever." And you use it like you use any other squash. So I brought it home and I cut it open. It looked exactly like this. And I was not at all surprised that it looked exactly like what I expected a squash to look like because I used what I know about squashes to sort of predict what was going to be in there. So we use similarity to make inductions all the time. The more si similar something is to what you know, the more confident you are in those inductions. So as confident as I am in what's going to be on the inside of a Hubbard squash, I'd be even more confident with every single pumpkin, right? Uh, the more often you cut open a pumpkin, you'd never be surprised to see something else inside a pumpkin, except for pumpkin insides, right? Every new pumpkin is a new pumpkin. There's always a chance that you've got like some weird rare pumpkin that's gonna open up blue on the inside, but it's never happened before. Every other pumpkin is like this. Every other Hubbard squash uh, that you open up looks like this. So similarity lets you predict the future. You say, this is similar to things that have happened in the past. And in the past, when I've cut open this squash, I get squash insides. So even though I can't see the insides, I can predict with reasonable certainty what's going to be in. That sounds kind of trivial, uh, but it is a, it's a really powerful kind of thinking, right? You're predicting something that you cannot see, something that you haven't experienced yet. You're predicting a future outcome of features that are unavailable to you. You can't see them. You don't know what's going to be there, but you kind of trust your instincts based on similarity. The more similar those things are, the stronger your confidence and the stronger your belief. So similarity lets us predict the future because if the situation you're in now is similar to a situation you've seen before, you know what's going to you know what to expect based on what's happened before. That's going to be the one of the entire underpinnings of our lecture on inference and induction. Uh, inductive reasoning and inferential reasoning depends uh, on categorical similarity. Uh, similarity lets us know, uh, this inductive process, what the next iteration of any kind of smartphone device is going to be. Um, you're of the sort of uh, early to mid, most of you are sort of in the uh, late, you're like about 20-ish, right? Most of you, is the average age you're about 20? Uh, so you probably, most of you, remember that there was a time before this device, uh, which was the time before smartphones, right? When phones looked like they did in that previous picture, which is they kind of resemble a landline phone, uh, just without a wire. Phones have sort of developed to the point where they don't change very much. So when Apple comes out with, this appears to be the, you may recognize which one this is, I'm going to say 12, but who knows, because they all start to look the same. So that might be an iPhone 12 or 13. I think we're on iPhone 14 right now, right? Uh, there's going to be an iPhone 15. And is it, what's it going to look like? It's going to look like this, right? It's not going to look uh, greatly different. So we kind of know, based on our familiarity, some spare design. Does anybody remember this one where you kind of slide the thing open and there was some a uh, little keyboard underneath. This was maybe like about 12, 15 years ago. Um, iPhones sort of uh, have, have evolved a little bit. Android phones have evolved a little bit. Um, but there's kind of a stable, it's a stable concept, right? When the next Pixel phone comes out, Google phone comes out, you know exactly what it's going to look like with maybe very small changes. When the next iPhone uh, is released next year, the iPhone 15, you know exactly what it's going to look like with a couple of small things. You can predict 
based on knowing it's an iPhone and based on your familiarity with prior iPhones, it might have a slightly bigger screen uh, or they might move uh, the front facing camera or change the design of the rear facing camera. In fact, that seems to be the only thing that changes on most of the smartphones over the last three or four years is the shape and configuration of the camera on the back because everything else is solved, right? There isn't really anything else you can do with the standard smartphone design except make the camera bigger and better, but also less intrusive. Uh, that's what people want is a better camera. So you can predict that the next iPhone will have a better camera. Otherwise they wouldn't have a next iPhone because there really isn't anything else uh, that needs to change. So we use this trajectory uh, of familiarity and similarity to predict what's coming next. Um, I said it's a domain general construct. Uh, what does that mean? This will only do this quick demonstration here. So that means it, uh, it allows us to connect directly uh, with lots of other kinds of similarity. What am I getting here? Domain general processes do not depend on a specific kind of similarity or a specific kind of information. So the inductive process that you use to predict what's gonna be in the inside of a Hubbard squash is the same inductive process that you use to predict what is gonna change from iPhone 14 to iPhone 15. Completely different ideas, right? Completely different products, and completely different kinds of predictions. But the similarity calculation is the same general calculation. And in the second half of today's lecture, when I talk about theories of similarity, we'll talk about how that's calculated mathematically. So that mathematical calculation of these things are similar or not similar is the same calculation, whether it's pumpkins or iPhones. Um, it works the same way for lots of different things. Um, it's also grounded in perception. So similarity is a direct connection to the perceptual physical outside world. What does this mean? Let me do a quick demonstration here and I'll show you what it sort of means. Um, this is from a chapter. I'm going to read through this example and then we'll do the example. Uh, a final reason to study similarity is that it occupies an important ground between perceptual constraints. So perceptual constraints are the things that we can perceive. We can't perceive everything, right? There are lots of uh, kinds of uh, light spectra that we can't perceive as humans. Uh, there are sounds that we cannot perceive as humans. So there are things we can perceive and things that we can't. So those are perceptual constraints. And higher level knowledge. So it kind of sits at this uh, important ground between what we can and can't perceive and what we can think about. Similarity is grounded by perceptual functions. A tone of 200 hertz and a tone of 202 hertz sound similar. So they sound the same to most of them. And we would, unless they were played right on top of each other, would probably think they're the same sound, even though they're different. They sound similar. And the reason they sound similar is because they're, they're really the same in uh, physics, right? They have the same uh, physical characteristics. The sound uh, has the same amplitude and the same wavelength. So amplitude in this case would be the, the would be perceived as the loudness, uh, wavelength would give you uh, the tone. If it's 200 hertz tone and 202 hertz tone, it's gonna sound like the same note to us. And it's gonna sound like the same note to us because in the physical world, the world of acoustics and the world of physics, it's actually the same kind of energy, right? So we think it's the same because it really is the same. Even if we're not there to hear it, it's still the same outside there in the physical world. Uh, and this similarity is cognitively impenetrable. In other words, it's really hard for us to explain why it's similar, except by appealing to the knowledge that it's the same tone. And it's really hard for us to uh, accept to change that uh, sense of similarity. So it's going to sound similar whether we want it to or not. It's impenetrable uh, to our cognitive, uh, cognitive ability. Little can be done to alter this perceived similarity. We can't make them sound more or less uh, like each other. Here's an example of what I mean here. So let's go to this tone generator. And let me play two tones here. And 
Let me go to the tone generator a second time here. Copy and paste this. Copy. And if I open up a second tab and I paste. All right, let's go to this one first. Let's do 200. That's a nice mellow sound, isn't it? The longer I left it on, the more irritating it would get. But for now, it's, it's not a bad sound, right? If I bump it up too, this changes the way the wavelengths are configured. So they're a little bit faster, right? They're faster wavelengths. Tell the difference? It's almost exactly the same, right? So I think if I go over here, and I do 200 again. And if I go here and do 2-2, two, two, you'll tell the difference because you'll hear when the waves bump into each other, right? So you know how sound waves are, right? They're waves like this. And you can sort of hear them oscillate now because they're not the same tone, right? They're not lined up exactly on top of each other, but if they are, now they're the same tone. So it's a different tone. It's different in the real world, and we can't help ourselves but see them as being really similar to each other. I gotta stop this now because it's a little loud. So what I, when I say that it's grounded in perceptual functions, um, I mean that it's as close as it can possibly be to the real physical outside world, the world that hasn't yet been uh, interpreted by our mind. Right? They're similar because they really are almost the same. Let's get back to our lecture here. Let me make this big again. End show. Go back to start show again. All right, so the last topic I want to cover in this first half of the lecture, and we're looking at uh, 1030, so we've been going for just about an hour, and I said this would be about an hour and 10 minutes. I think that's about right. I want to talk about three different ways to measure similarity. So I think we've got a good sense of why it's important to study similarity. I think we've also got a good sense of uh, how similarity is involved in thinking and cognition. Let's talk about how we want to measure it. Um, that's an important aspect too, because in the next lecture after this, after the break, uh, we'll talk about different theories of similarity, which depend on how we measure similarity. The way in which you measure similarity can change uh, the way in which we interpret things. So I want to talk about ratings task, which you should all probably be familiar with, uh, because it's really common to ask people, uh, are these things similar or not? Rate on a scale of one to seven. One of the most common things in all of psychology uh, is the seven point scale, right? A rating scale of something. Do I like this? Yes or no? On a scale of one to seven. Uh, and so we see there's a midpoint and two endpoints. We can do the same thing with similarity. We can ask people to compare two things. Um, we can also do a forced choice task. Forced choice task is usually presenting three different things and saying which two are the most similar. Choose the two that are the most alike. Uh, and that lets us know something about what people consider important and not important when they're calculating similarity. Uh, and also we can ask people to just sort things into groups that are the most uh, similar. So if I show you these two cartoon fish, these are two stimuli that we used in a, a developmental uh, paper a few years back where we were asking how children learn new concepts. Uh, and so we sometimes use fairly simple, straightforward perceptual objects that have different features. If I ask you to rate these on a scale of one to seven with one being not at all similar and seven being very similar, what's the number that you would uh, give these? I don't know. I mean, based on a based on nothing at all, I might say three. Right? I mean, I have no idea. Uh, why do I, why is it hard to come up with an answer to something like this? Because there's no like context, like how different other things. Can we be. need some context, exactly. Uh, so usually, you need a little bit of context. I mean, these could be highly similar if I'm comparing them to scrambled eggs. Uh, right, something that looks completely different. 
Uh, these could be not at all similar if I'm comparing it to an identical fish with exactly these features, right? So right now I don't know. So I'm gonna pick something in the middle. I'm gonna say this is about a three. Uh, and then let's look at another comparison. Uh, so is this higher or lower? Is this a one to a seven? What would you say about this? Well, in the context here, uh, I gave these a three. These seem like they're, I don't know, I kind of feel like this is almost the same. They seem more or less similar. When you're calculating the similarity of this, what do you do? What's the, what's the phenomenological experience? What are you doing to come up with a number? First of all, one, two, three, four. Yes, let's say four. If you come up with four, what's the process? How do you come up with the number four? Well, you look at the similar features between the two. You could count the features. You could literally say, okay, they got the same uh, dorsal fin. They've got the same uh, nose. They've got the same eye. Uh, they're both fish. They have a different tail, so that detracts. They've got different patterns that detracts. They got different shapes. Uh, these guys, uh, they look. Uh, they got the same tail, different uh, different fins, different pattern, different lips on them. Uh, these uh, also uh, looking not so similar, but maybe a little bit more so. Uh, they've got the same stripe on them. So you can compare these things uh, based on counting up the number of features. And if I showed you a whole bunch of these, all of the possible configurations, you'd eventually come up with something that most of us agree on, which is if they differ by zero features, they'd be highly similar. If they differ by one feature, they would be a little less similar. And if they differ by all of the features, they would be not at all similar. So if you did, uh, if you completed you know, 100 or so trials like this, uh, you might not all agree on every single pair, but what we probably come up with is something that is fairly consistent. Right? We would all generally do it by counting the features, and we would all find that identity matches, so the same fish compared with itself, is high, and fish that have no features in common are low. And the context would let us eventually come up with all of these in-between cases. How similar are these things, are these high or low? Ignoring the fish from before, uh, these to me seem like they're more on the seven and I'm generally gonna give these a higher number, uh, but I don't know exactly why yet, except that when I look at them, they kind of look almost, but not exactly the same. Uh, if I look at another pair of things like this, high or low, this is lower than the previous one. Uh, and why is this lower than the previous one? The lines on the right are more, more spaced out. So we've got a higher, sort of a lower spatial frequency of uh, light and dark band. Uh, I look at one more pair. I've got now two things going different. I've got different uh, spatial frequency and I've got a little bit of different angle uh, of the light and dark band. Uh, so just like with the fish, uh, we can sort of count or at least label the features independently. Uh, and so it might be that if two things are mostly the same on orientation, but differ on spatial frequency of light and dark bands, uh, we would give them a medium high number. Uh, and then the same is true if they're mostly the same on frequency, but different on tilt, uh, medium high frequency. But if we see some differences on combination, it pushes it a little bit lower. Most of us would find this to be a little bit less clear, though, because we can't label each feature independ independently and add them up. Right, because these combinations of, of spatial frequency and tilt are harder to label independently than it has three out of five features uh, in common. What about this? Are these similar or not similar? I mean, I guess they're similar. Uh, if you had to give these a number, I might give these a six. Uh, suppose we look at the next pair. If you had to give these a number, is this a higher number or lower number than the previous pair? How many would say this is more similar? How many would say this is less similar? If you say it's more similar, why is this more similar than the pair before? Um, this time they're both cool toned. They're both cool toned. In this one, I guess they were less, the one on the right might've been a little less cool toned. Uh, I think you're right. They're definitely a little bit more similar. Um, how about this pair? This is a different pair, higher or lower? 
Now, if we did a series of these, uh, here's another one. This is definitely a little bit more similar, I think, than what we've been seeing so far. Um, if you find this to be more similar, what's the reason? I find when I look at these, the only thing I can come up with is, well, this is more similar because they look more similar. <laughs> uh, and I really don't know how to explain it, right? Uh, sometimes they're both cool tones. So now if I had a if I had a, a bright yellow in here, we would say these are very different. And the reason they're very different is they're different colors. So we would have the same problem looking at high differences, right? We would say these are similar because they're similar. We would say a yellow, uh, and do I have a yellow? That would be kind of nice if I did. Uh, we would say these are different because they are different, uh, but it's kind of hard to describe what that difference is. Unlike the fish and unlike the, uh, the, the gray grading patterns, uh, this doesn't have as easy of a way to say it shares three out of five features, or it matches on one feature, but not on the other feature, or it's really close on one of the features, but not close on one of the other features. We tend to just say these things are less similar because they don't look as much alike. Uh, and that's not really a satisfactory explanation to most of us if we really wanted to come up with how we're doing. It. We're clearly able to tell. Uh, but we're not always able to say how we're able to tell. Um, we can also use, so that's a ratings task. Some of them seem more straightforward uh, than others. We can use the same kind of stimuli to measure similarity in what's known as a force choice, forced choice task. Uh, a forced choice task asks you to pick which one of two things are more similar to the target above. So, do you find this really easy? Do you find this a little bit easier? Which one is more similar? It's the one on the left, right? Uh, which one is more, if we want to sort, can we sort these into groups? Usually we can do it based on a feature that we didn't even know we knew, which in this case might be luminosity or brightness. Uh, so although it's difficult to do a ratings task with something where we can't label what the features are, we can often sort them. And most of us would sort these in the same way. How many of you would sort this by putting the darker ones on one side and the lighter ones on the other side? I suspect all of us would sort them in the same way. Maybe we didn't know that brightness or luminosity was a feature that we could label. But when we see them all together, then we realize what that feature is. And we can usually use that feature to group things together. These are the things that are more similar to each other. And these are the things that are more similar to each other. So three different ways to assess and measure similarity. Ratings tasks, which ask you to compare two things and describe them with a number. Forced choice tasks, which ask you to compare three things and choose two things with a, with a decision. And sorting tasks, which ask you to group things together on one side and group things together on the other side based on whatever criteria seems to be the most salient. Um, in most cases, when people are asked to group things, they pick the most obvious and salient single feature. That's not always true for forced choice and for ratings tasks. I think this is the final slide of the first half, am I correct? And I feel like if I went one more slide, it would be two slides too many. I feel like it's just about time for a break. Uh, so let's do that. Let's take a break for about 10 minutes. Uh, come back at about 10 50, 10 55, uh, and continue on. And we'll have the second half of the lecture. I'm <laughs> Not that person.